Hi, everybody. My name is Carl Darden, and I'd like to welcome and thank all of you for joining us today here on Navy Sports Central. I'm your host, and this is the official podcast of the Navy Sports Nation, where we take a deeper dive into Navy sports. In this episode, we're going to get into some serious numbers by taking a look at the five statistics that will determine the winner of just about any college football game today. And then we're going to apply those statistics to last year's Army-Navy game to see how well they hold up. And just so you know, this will be the model that we use to break down all the mids games this season. We'll also get you updated on the fall sports that are already in action and bring you our question of the day. It's less than a week until the mids take the field against Delaware, and now is the time to go into full college football mode. For that, this is right where you want to be. So don't go anywhere. We'll jump right into everything as soon as we come back. Hi, everyone. So glad to have you with us as we continue counting down to game day on Saturday. Uh, Later, I'll go over five different stats that are proving to be the best ways to analyze college football games. But first, I wanted to get you all up to speed on some of the fall sports teams that are already in action. We're going to start with women's soccer. Five games in, they are 2-1-2, and and the defense has only given up two goals. Uh, They opened the season with a 2-0 win over uh, the Citadel and followed that up by battling Western Carolina to a 1-1 tie. Next, um, the Mids just absolutely rolled Marymount University by a 6 nothing score. Uh, in that game, two sophomores played a huge role. Uh, Tori Leeson and Ashley Yee had a hand in all six of the Mids' goals. Yee came up with two in the second half, while Leeson, who is a midfielder, added a goal and also three assists. Over the weekend, they took on in-state rival Maryland. Uh, this was a great back-and-forth game. Uh, Navy took the lead early, just one minute in, on a nice goal off of a corner kick, but the Terps came back and tied things up before the end of the first half. And after the break, the two teams just continued to go at it. Each had some pretty good scoring opportunities, but their respective defenses held up and the game ended in a 1-1 tie. Oh, and by the way, there's a, a big rule change for this year in both men's and women's soccer, so I wanted to go over that with you real quick. There's not going to be any more overtime if the game is tied after 90 minutes during the regular season. And during the playoffs, the teams will play those two extra 10-minute periods if necessary. But The other big change is that there's not going to be any more sudden victory when there's a goal scored in the overtime uh, to end the game. They basically have to play the entire period uh, to determine the winner. So in other words, if the two teams are tied and they go into the first overtime period and a team scores, say, like three minutes in, the game's not over then. They're just going to continue to play the remaining seven minutes. And if that score holds up, then that's the result. If the other team comes back and ties, of course, they'll go into the second overtime with the same rules applying. And then after the two overtime periods, if the two teams are still tied, that's when they're going to go move to penalty kicks. But during the regular season, no overtime periods. They're going to put a little bit more value on the tie. And to tell you the truth, I think this is a pretty good move because cutting down on playing time during the year can definitely help teams stay healthier going into the postseason. And besides, when the rules committee looked at the numbers, it turns out that nearly half of the games that were tied at the end of regulation stayed that way after the two overtime periods. So Uh, What they decided to do was just to take away some of the physical wear and tear from the teams and just place a little bit more value on the tie itself. The uh, men's soccer team also won their home opener against St. Joe's last week. Uh, Junior Baba Kali scored just seconds into the second half off of an assist by David Jackson to give the mids the lead. And he almost had a second goal about 18 minutes later, but the shot slid just wide. Uh, Coach Tim O'Donohue's defense was solid throughout the game, and Kali's goal stood up to give the mids a shutout. As far as the uh, outlook for this season, it is going to be kind of weird not seeing Matt Nasita back there uh, on the defensive side of the ball. But the mids returned a pretty talented team. They've got some good depth and, uh, again, a nice blend of uh, younger players and uh, also experience to go along with that. So I'm pretty sure they're going to be as competitive as they've always been the last few years. The uh, volleyball team also got their season started over the weekend by playing in a four-team round-robin tournament over in College Park, Maryland. Um, things were kind of rough in the first two matches, though, against Florida Gulf Coast and the Terps. Um, these are two pretty tough teams. The Eagles are the defending ASUN conference champions. I guess that's how you say that. I don't know if that's the old Sun Belt Conference or if it's pronounced ASUN or whatever, but it's a D1 uh, program. And um, the Mids lost to them in, I believe, four sets. And the uh, Terps are coming off a strong 19-win season last year. They, they handled the Mids pretty easily, uh, three to nothing. But Navy did beat Rhode Island on Saturday to get their first win. Uh, Jordan and Jamie Llewellyn led the offense, combining for 29 kills during the match. And Maggie Bodman led the team with seven blocks, while freshman Ava Toppin had five blocks and eight kills in what was a pretty efficient game for her. So I'm looking forward to watching her play as the season goes on. The uh, Mids were picked to finish fourth in the Patriot League, which isn't horrible considering how competitive it is. 
they've got a lot of talent, but there's no question that they're a young team. Uh, Captain Sealy Fury is the only senior, but um, who knows? They can still wind up surprising some people. I just remember how well the, the mids played down the stretch last season in upsetting Army to get to the uh, Patriot League semifinal. So you just never know what's going to happen. All right, that pretty much does it for the uh, sports update. But I did want to mention two other athletes who had a terrific summer. Um, First is Isaiah Drake. He is a sophomore gymnast, and he competed in the U.S. National Championships this past summer and finished 14th in the all-around competition. That was pretty awesome in and of itself. But then USA Gymnastics named him to their developmental team. And I'm pretty sure that's a first for Navy Gymnastics, so congratulations to Isaiah. And then finally, Jackson Bonnets, who uh, was a member of the under-22 U.S. men's national lacrosse team, ended up bringing home the gold medal when the U.S. defeated Canada 12-10. to Bonnets had an outstanding tournament, and in fact, he even scored two goals, and in addition to being a, a, a key member of the, uh, of the U.S. team's um, interior defense. So congratulations to both athletes on having such a fantastic summer. Coming up next, we've got our deep dive segment, and if you want to learn about the best statistics to focus on when analyzing a college football game, you will not want to miss it. Okay, we are back with our deep dive segment, and today we're going to take a really close look at what could be the most definitive way to analyze college football games that I've ever come across. About two months ago, I was doing some research while getting ready for the upcoming sports year and stumbled onto a really interesting article by Bill Connolly. He is a college sports editor and analytics director for SB Nation. In the article, Connolly makes a pretty good case for college football teams to just focus on five main factors when it comes to winning. So what we're going to do in the first part of this deep dive segment is to go through each of the five statistics. First, I'll define what it is in detail, and then I'm going to tell you what the target numbers are for each statistic and how they relate to the probability of winning the game. After that, we're going to apply each of those numbers to last year's Army-Navy game to see how well they hold up. So let's go ahead and get started. And oh, by the way, if you look at a standard college football box score, only one of these stats is going to show up. The um, other four need to be figured out, but uh, I'll go ahead and take care of that. And um, I don't know, maybe sometime down the road, the analytics guys will go ahead and add those other four stats uh, to the box score. Okay, our our first metric is explosiveness. This is simply a measure of how many yards the offense picks up per play. There's been a tendency in the past to focus on total yards gained in a game, but things are kind of starting to shift to this per play perspective to get a better indication of how explosive the offense is. The key here is to look at the per play margins between the two teams. Um, A look at the data shows that uh, if a team gained more than four yards per play than their opponent, they won 100% of the time. And and not only that, but they won by an average of nearly 42 points. If that margin drops by two to three yards per play, the chances of winning come down by only 5%, and the team with the higher explosiveness number wins by an average of almost 24 points. Even when you look at the smallest increment of zero to 0.5 yards, The team with the advantage comes out on top about 55% of the time, and the average margin of victory is at least 2.2 points. Now, you can see how important explosiveness is in an offensive system like Navy runs. By design, the triple option grinds out an average of 4 to 5 yards per play if it's operating efficiently, and that's going to result in those long, demoralizing drives that just wear opponents down. That could be damaging enough, Uh, and then when you have a dynamic player like Malcolm Perry with the ball in his hands, the explosiveness factor goes way up, and that's one reason why the mids were so dominant in 2019. Now, obviously, uh, Navy quarterback Ty Lavatai is uh, nothing like Malcolm Perry when it comes to running the ball, but, but he doesn't have to be. Uh, when you think about guys like Will Worth, Aaron Polanco, guys like that, they were very, very good, tough runners who got the yards when they needed them. And um, besides that, Lavatai's got plenty of weapons at the fullback spot and also the slot backs to uh, create this explosiveness that Navy's going to need to be successful this year. So I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with the fact that they have the people back there to get the job done. All right, now let's move on to our second metric that's a good predictor of uh, victory in college football. Uh, This one is called efficiency, and it's actually a more accurate assessment of explosiveness. The efficiency can be broken down by individual plays. And in the most simplest terms, it's defined by picking up 50% of the yards needed on first down, 70% of those yards on second down, and of course, 100% of the needed yards on third or fourth down. This is critical because it provides a really clear picture of whether or not the offense is on schedule. Since the triple option relies mostly on the run, the more efficient the offense can be on first down, the better chances for success. So a typical set of downs, assuming the mid start with first and 10, would result in gains of at least five yards on first down, three and a half yards on second down, and a yard and a half or more on third down, or or fourth down if they come up short. 
the one thing I wanted to point out is if the triple option offense is running efficiently and they're throwing the ball reasonably well, Navy's going to be pretty tough to beat. And that's obviously because the offense is going to be in third and short situations most of the time, which is a pretty good spot to be in. Uh, you think about somebody like Lavatai, who is a very, very tough inside runner, and he can throw the ball. There's a chance he could surprise the defense with a pass on a third and short. Or who knows, Coach Jasper may even throw in a pass on first down every so often just to keep the defense honest. This is why it was great to see Ty Lavatai really make some huge strides in uh, learning the offense, both in the spring practices and also into uh, the summer workouts as we head into the first game of the season. Because we saw how good his decision making was in the Army game, and we also saw how well he could throw the ball. So you put those two things together, and there could be some really exciting things happening on offense for Navy this year especially when you have targets like Mark Walker and Jay Umbarger to throw to. Our uh, next statistic that we'll look at is uh, starting field position. Now, sometimes you will see these numbers pop up on the screen at some point during a game. And if you're like me and you're looking at a couple of spread offenses going at each other, you wouldn't think that starting field position would be all that big a deal. But the fact is, the shorter the distance you are from the end zone, the better your chances are getting there. And that's also reflected in the winning percentages. Teams with an average starting field position between the 32 and 36 yard line uh, won about two thirds of the time. And if they begin those drives between the 24 and 28 yard line, those chances of winning drop to about 32%. So just that little eight yard difference reduces the chances of the team winning by half. In fact, a little over half. The uh, more important indicator here is the difference between the two teams in starting field position. If it's between three and six yards, the team with the advantage is likely to win about 60% of the time, and they're going to win by about a touchdown. Even if it's only 0 to 3 yards, the chances of winning are still pretty decent at 54%. Now, when it comes to starting field position, the special teams is the one unit that has the biggest impact on this. And that's why I'm also kind of excited to see what Navy does in this department during the upcoming year, because you all know what Mikhail Haywood can do with the ball in his hands. Uh, this guy's a dynamic runner. He makes people miss. And that kickoff return he had against East Carolina last year was really something to see. I'm not saying he's going to do that every time, but if this guy gets his hands on the ball, um, he's a threat to go. And being able to get him out there in space, that's easily going to help improve Navy's chances of starting with better field position every time they have the ball, whether it's off of a kickoff or a punt. So uh, starting field position is important, but as most of us know, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And that's why we're going to take a look at our next metric, which is uh, finishing drives. Now, one stat I pay really close attention to when the mids play is red zone efficiency. We all know how competitive the college game is, so the mids need to score touchdowns basically every time they get inside the 20. Now, Bill Connolly has a slightly different take. Um, his target is the opponent's 40-yard line. I'm not sure why he did it that way, but I'm thinking it's because there are a decent number of drives that will stall outside the 20-yard line. And, of course, this is considered field goal range for most teams, so it does make sense to just go for the three points. Um, according to the numbers, uh, to have a better than 50% chance of winning, teams need to score at least four to four and a half points per trip inside their opponent's 40-yard line. If they can bump that up to five and a half to seven points, the winning probability jumps up to almost 73%. Now, here's one important thing worth noting. Let's suppose you have two teams playing and one of them gets across the, the other team's 40-yard line, say, five times during a game, while their opponent makes it across um, six times. Now, this is why those numbers I just mentioned make such a big difference. Teams that cross their opponent's 40-yard line fewer times but average more points per trip still have a decent chance of winning. That happened roughly 47% of the time, according to the numbers. So the bottom line is once teams get within 40 yards of the goal line, getting that football across it consistently can make things really, really tough on the other team. And if you are efficient scoring when you get inside the opponent's 40, you may not need as many trips inside that zone to come away with the win. So no big surprises here, right? I mean, we've always known that for the mids to be successful, they have to make the most of their scoring opportunities, not just inside the red zone, but now, according to Connolly, once they cross the 40-yard line, they better be coming away with something. Uh, I, I keep thinking back to that game against Houston, uh, what was it, about six years ago, we'll call it? Yeah, 2016. Will Worth led the mids to that huge upset over the Cougars, which was uh, Navy's biggest upset since they'd knocked off uh, South Carolina in 1984. But the reason they won that game was because they were so incredibly efficient on offense and they, they scored basically every time they touched the ball. And they needed to because they only won the game by six points. So that right there tells you how critical it is to finish those drives. Okay, we are just about home. Our uh, final statistic we'll check out is turnovers. This is the one you're going to see in every college or pro football box score. And there's a reason why it's there, right? I mean, 
it doesn't take a genius to figure out that if you keep giving the ball to the other team, you're not going to have as many chances to score yourself. Even a turnover margin of plus one results in a win nearly 65% of the time. And if that number goes up to plus two, the chances of winning jump up to 79%. So this basically validates what we already know. Um, the mids play in a competitive conference, and they have another very tough schedule this year. So for them to win consistently, they just can't afford to give their opponents any extra scoring opportunities by turning over the ball. All right, those are the five most important factors to look at when analyzing college football games. I'll tell you what, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll use these numbers to look back at Navy's biggest win of the season last year. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us here on Navy Sports Central. Carl Darden here with you. And now it's time to put these five factors that we just discussed to the test. I went back and reviewed every play of last year's Army-Navy game to see how these numbers held up. And uh, the one thing I will say is thank God for ESPN because uh, they give you a ton of information on every college football game. So let's go ahead and start with explosiveness. Um, the mids average a little over five yards per play, uh, 5.05 to be exact, versus 4.73 for the Black Knights. Now, that's not much of a difference, I agree, but statistically, remember that even an advantage of 0.0 to 0.5 yards results in a win 55% of the time, and your margin of victory is just a little over two points. The one thing I'll ask you to keep in mind, though, is Army gained 56 of those yards on one play. If you remember, Christian Anderson broke that one for the, I think it was the fourth play of the game for that 56-yard touchdown run. And by contrast, Navy's longest play from scrimmage was 27 yards. So if we toss out both of those plays, that difference increases a little bit for the mids. They, they gained 4.4 yards per play compared to 3.66 for the Black Knights. So after that first series, it was pretty clear that Coach Newberry's defense quickly tightened down the screws on Army's offense. But the, uh, the numbers we'll stick with will be the 5.05 for Navy and 4.73 for Army. And when you look at the final score, it was 17 to 13. So that four point margin of victory pretty much lines up with the 2.2 that was predicted with the uh, team that had the uh, per play average advantage um, in that range of zero to about half a yard. So in this particular game, the explosiveness factor was a pretty good indicator of the game's outcome. Okay, now let's take a look at efficiency. Uh, remember, this is defined as how often the offense picks up the targeted number of yards depending on the down. And for this one, what I did do is I tossed out the last three downs for the mid since they basically ran the victory formation to run out the clock. Those were irrelevant, so I, I didn't count them. Uh, their success rate was nearly 10% better than Army's. Uh, those numbers were 38.2% versus 28.6%. Uh, and that advantage was most obvious when you look at third and fourth down efficiency. The Navy defense held the Black Knights to 4 of 12 on third down conversions and 0 for 1 on fourth down. Meanwhile, Ty Lavatai and the offense made good on 6 of 15 third down opportunities, including his huge touchdown run on third and goal from the 8 in the first quarter. And the mids were also a perfect 2 for 2 on fourth down conversions, the second of which was that fake punt when Diego Fago picked up the first down. And of course, that led to the 43 yard Bijan Nichols field goal that provided the four point winning margin. So now you're going to see how that advantage in efficiency carried directly over into our next statistic, which is uh, finishing drives. The mids got inside Army's 40-yard line four times and came away with 17 points. Both touchdowns came from inside the red zone. Uh, for the field goal, they got as far as Army's 21-yard line before getting backed up and then finally ha having to kick it from the, I think the, uh, the point. Was, yeah, it was a 43-yard field goal, like I mentioned before. Uh, on the other hand, the Black Knights managed only two trips inside Navy's 40, and all they got out of it was six points. In fact, they were in the red zone on both of those occasions, and the Navy defense just slammed the door on them. So when you look and see how both teams performed here, you had the mid scoring uh, 4.25 points per trip inside the opponent's 40. Um, and that, according to Connolly's numbers, gave them close to a 52% chance of winning. So, you know, a 50-50 coin flip there. But then when you, when you look at how Army did, they only scored three points per trip inside Navy's 40, which resulted in a chance of winning of only 23%. And, and by the way, the average margin of victory there was a minus 14 so this inability to finish drives with touchdowns is what ultimately did Army in. Okay, on to our fourth metric, which is uh, starting field position. This one actually favored Army by a significant margin. Uh, they started each drive from about the 32-yard line, while the mids began from the 22. Now, according to the numbers, that 10-yard difference usually results in a win more than 78% of the time for the team with the advantage, and it's also by an average of 16 points. 
Uh, of course, that didn't happen this time, thanks to the outstanding Navy defense. And that brings us to the last stat in our analysis, which is uh, turnovers and turnover margin. This one didn't figure into the outcome at all, since neither team gave up the ball, so we'll just call that one a wash. That means that when we look at the final tally, Navy came out ahead in three of the factors we discussed, explosiveness, efficiency, and finishing drives, while Army had the advantage in starting field position. And then finally, of course, turnover margin didn't even come into play. So taken all together, Bill Connolly's statistics hold up pretty well when breaking down last year's Army-Navy game. We're going to continue using them to review the mids games this season, starting with Delaware on Saturday. Okay, that takes care of our deep dive segment. We'll be back shortly with our question of the day. I'm Carl Darden, and you're listening to Navy Sports Central. All right, it is time for our question of the day. And as always, let's go back and check our responses uh, from our last question. Um, You'll recall from our conversation with Jim Keneally on our last episode, um, I asked, what's the farthest distance you've traveled to support your athletes in their respective sports for a single game or event? And the choices were uh, A, less than 100 miles, B, between 100 and 200 miles, C, uh, between 200 and 300 miles, and D, more than 300 so we actually had a really good response to this question. There were 67% of you who answered D, more than 300 miles. And that was actually my selection also. Um, I think it was about eight or nine years ago, my son was playing in a club basketball tournament up in Las Vegas. And the drive from Phoenix is just over 300 miles. Um, there were 15% of you who came back with 200 to 300 miles, followed by 10% who traveled uh, between 1 and 200 miles, and finally 6% who were able to stay within 100 miles uh, to support their athletes. So anyway, oh, one more thing. The, uh, it turns out that the road warrior in this group is, uh, is Scott Booth. Uh, he made a trip of uh, 2,500 miles to watch Navy beat Army in a college sprint football championship. So pretty impressive, Scott. Good job. All right, now let's look at our question from this episode. Um, we all know that Navy will be taking on Delaware in their home opener on Saturday. So the question is, how many times have the Mids won their home opener since Ken Niamatololo has been the head coach? And by that, I mean their first home game of the season, whether or not it was the very first game overall. And uh, your choices are very straightforward. A is uh, nine wins, B, 10, C, 11, and D, 12 wins. You can respond by going to the Navy Sports Nation group Facebook page, and I should have that up by the end of the day. Or you can drop me a quick email at carld at navysportsnation.com. Um, looking forward to reading your responses. Okay, this is where we'd normally check in on our athletes in our mid-watch segment. And as I mentioned in our last episode, Ellie Abraham and Keegan Shreves will get their respective seasons started in the uh, next couple of weeks. Abraham will lace up her running shoes to compete in the Salisbury Fall Classic on Saturday, and Shreves tees off the following week against St. John's up in Farmingdale, New York. Um, getting back to Ellie Abraham, I think we're going to be hearing her name quite a bit between now and this coming spring. She had a really strong cross-country season last year. Um... Against Army, she led her group of five runners across the finish line, finishing between second and sixth place, and that helped the mids take the star by a score of uh, 20 to 35. Uh, remember, in cross country, by the way, the low score wins. So, um, And then also in the um, Patriot League championships, the team ended up executing their racing strategy perfectly and ended up placing five runners in the top 12. And uh, that was good enough to give them the title. Abraham also competes in the middle to long distances during the indoor and outdoor track seasons. Um, in fact, she finished second in the 800 meter indoors last year at the Patriot League Championships, and she's the defending champion in the 3,000 meter steeplechase outdoors. So that gives you a little bit more insight into Ellie Abraham's Navy career so far, and um, the good news is she's just a junior. Uh, now let's go ahead and find out a little bit more about Keegan Shreves. He is the captain of the Navy men's golf team this season. Uh, I think I mentioned that in the last episode. Shreves had the uh, second lowest stroke average on the team last year, and he was the mid's top finisher at the UConn Invitational. He was also named to the Academic All-Patriot League golf team, one of only six golfers to earn that honor. He's a quantitative economics major with a 3.71 grade point average. So Shreves is just another example of a Navy student athlete getting it done in the classroom as well as against the competition. Okay, before I sign off, I did want to just uh, run down Navy's starting lineups on both offense and defense, just to let you guys know what you'll be seeing out there on Saturday. Uh, this is the latest depth chart. I don't know the last time they updated it, but we're just going to go with it and see what happens. All right. So at wide receiver, expect to see Jaden Umbarger out there. Left tackle, Sam Glover. Left guard, Lirian Moretzi. Uh, center will be David Hickson. 
uh, our right guard, Josh Pena, at right tackle, Kip Franklin. And then at the other wide receiver, we're going to have Mark Walker, uh, slot backs, Vince Terrell Jr. And then, of course, at quarterback, we have Ty Levitai. The other slot back position, Mikhail Haywood. And then uh, our fullback is Anton Hall Jr. Okay. Um, on the defensive side of the ball, we got Jake Busick at uh, left end, Donald Brainerd at nose guard, Clay Cromwell at defensive tackle. At Raider, we got Nicholas Straw. Striker will be John Marshall. At the uh, mic position, we're going to have Gianni Brooks. Um, that's a little bit of a surprise. Will Harbour is listed at number two there. I'm wondering if he got a little bit dinged up during uh, practices. I'm not sure. Um, at the will position, um, Colin Ramos. At the field corner, we're going to have Mabiti Williams. Free safety, Rayon Lane. At the bandit, we're going to have Evan Gibbons. And at the boundary corner, we'll be seeing Elias Larry. As far as the specialist position goes, uh, our field goal kicker, of course, is Bijan Nichols, and he'll be handling the uh, kickoffs as well. Uh, the punter, uh, I'm going to go with Riley Reithman. I think that's how you're going to pronounce that name. I'm not real sure. Uh, long snapper, Ethan Wynn. The holder is going to be Daniel Davies. And then our punt returners are going to be Amin Hassan and Mark Walker and also Mikhail Haywood and uh, Vincent Terrell Jr. returning kickoffs. Okay, so that pretty much covers everybody. So we'll see how things go on Saturday. That's going to do it for this edition of Navy Sports Central. Thank you all so much for joining us. Now, if you like what you've heard, be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. And remember to spread the word to all the other Navy fans out there. We have been getting a great response to our question of the day. So if you want to jump in on that, just go to the Navy Sports Nation group Facebook page. I will go ahead and pin it to the top uh, so you won't miss it. And just a quick reminder, the views expressed on Navy Sports Central are my own and do not reflect those of the U.S. Naval Academy or Navy Athletics. By the way, the music used in Navy Sports Central comes to you courtesy of Audio Jungle. This is a great site for purchasing the rights to use music from thousands of artists around the world. And those we feature in the podcast will be credited in our show notes. Talk to you soon, everybody. Until next time, this is Carl Darden. Go Navy, beat Army. <laughs>